Testing one, two, test mic. We have the on air, you hear me now? All right, so microphone's working online. Let's test the backup microphone. All right, testing the backup microphone, testing the microphone. Um, yep, you hear me now? Perfect. All right, awesome.
Okay, it's five o'clock, and so I want to welcome you all to the third lecture of the 28th annual The Fever Use Winter Series on Aging. I'm your host, Elena Volpin. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, is the volume all right? Yeah? Okay. So this lecture series, as you know, um, features national and internationally uh, renowned speakers who focus on topics relevant to aging and geriatrics and honors the memory of Dr. Edward Lefevre and his daughter, Dr. Nancy Lefevre Hughes. They were both highly respected physicians here on Galveston Island, professors of medicine at UTMB and primary care providers for many Galvestonians. And they love to take care of older adults. Um, so after Dr. Uh, Edward Lefebvre uh, died, the family and friends endowed this uh, lecture series in the Center on Aging uh, to honor his memory. And then after last year, um, Dr. Nancy uh, Hughes uh, unfortunately died prematurely, uh, family and friends um, have further contributed to this, to this endowment to honor also her memory. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing a friend and a collaborator um, and a national leader and international leader in aging uh, research, Dr. George Cushell. Dr. Cushell is the professor and traveler's chair in geriatrics and gerontology, the director of the Center on Aging, the chief of geriatric medicine, and the director of the Pepper Center of the University of Connecticut Health um, Science, I think. And um, he uh, got his undergraduate um, degree from uh, Vanier College and his medical degree from McGill University, which are both in Canada. Um, and then did his residency training in internal medicine at the Montreal General Hospital, and then went on to do the fellowships in geriatrics, gerontology, and epidemiology at Harvard where he also completed a postdoctoral training in, bio, in biological chemistry, molecular pharmacology, and neurobiology. And then he went back to Canada. So he's been crossing the border a few times. He went back to Canada and became an assistant and an associate professor at McGill University and then worked also again at uh, in Montreal Hospital. And then he moved back to the U.S., this time in Connecticut, where he's been ever since for more than 20 years now, uh, where he has uh, progressed in his career all the way up to the uh, positions that he's holding right now. So um, his research focuses on geroscience, uh, which is a novel concept that seeks to understand um, how the basic biological mechanisms of aging lead to the well-known health changes that occur as we age, and then um, and how uh, and, and then it looks at finding treatments and interventions that can slow down functional decline and those chronic diseases that affect uh, older adults by targeting specifically the pillars of aging, so this basic biological mechanisms of aging. So essentially, is looking for the elixir of, of long life. And that's what we all hope for, you know, something that can slow down aging, compress all the, the bad stuff that can happen as we get older to the last very minute, and, and so that we can live a full, healthy life uh, for as long as we can. So... Um, his uh, research is uh, funded by large grants. He's the principal investigator on several large collaborative uh, NIH-funded grants like the Sennet Caps and Tissue Mapping Center and the NIH Geroscience Education and Training Web Network and obviously the Pepper Center. Uh, he's published more than 200 papers in uh, peer-reviewed journals and has received also many honors and awards, including the uh, John Hartford Leadership Award, and is also a senior of the um, a senior fellow of the prestigious Brookdale Foundation. He served as the chair of the NIH Aging System and Geriatric Studies section, and is currently deputy editor of the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. So, tonight he will talk about the University of Connecticut Pepper Center early insights into precision gerontology and geroscience so please join me to welcome Dr. George Cushell. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lorena. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's going to be tough to live up to, but it, it's wonderful to be here. Can everybody hear me all right? Uh, and uh, it's great to be here and, uh, and to, see, to really see firsthand the wonderful accomplishments here at, 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 the, at the Pepper Center and, and the Sealy Center and the great things that have been done here. It's really spectacular, all the multidisciplinary work that's ongoing or here. Uh, very exciting. And thank you. I'm also very excited to be joined by uh, uh, some of our friends from the community here. So that, that's, that's great. And uh, that's what these should be about. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And so basically what I'd like to do today is just kind of introduce some, some, some words that are maybe a little bit new uh, and, and really ask the question of why precision gerontology and geroscience. And, and I want to convince you today that you cannot do one without the other, and I'll, I'll elaborate further. And what I'd like to do, uh, as Elena mentioned, I was trained in Canada, and one of the things I always like to do is try to frame my presentations in the context of a clinical case. So I'll, I'll be, uh, my whole discussion today is going to revolve around a, a clinical case that, that to, help, um, uh, to help illustrate some of the issues that I want to, uh, and points that I want to share with you today. And I'll, I'd like to also provide some early updates on our Pepper Center. We're only in our second year of funding. Uh, unlike the Pepper Center here, which has been funded since... Uh, ancient Greeks, I think, or since, uh, since the prehistoric age. How many years has it been, Jim? It's been uh, 23. 23. That's a long time. So we're, we're in our second year of funding. So we're, we're kind of the new kid on the block. So to provide you some early updates about the work we're doing. And, and so I want to begin by talking with you uh, uh, about a concept that, that has really come close to our heart. And it's kind of at the core of, I think, everything we understand about aging today. And that's the heterogeneity of, of aging trajectories, how no two older adults are really quite alike. And this is, a, this is a drawing from the 17th century, and I think you can all see that. And what it illustrates is how we conceived aging in the 17th century, which is that, and we still do in many ways, which is that you, you, you rise to this pinnacle of success. And this is actually, I think, an illustration of a tenured professor, probably an Italian university in the 17th century, who is obviously the pinnacle of success the moment he's named a tenured professor. And then it's an inevitable decline downhill. And I think, um, I think we all realize that, that aging is incredibly variable. Uh, how, we all age. It's, it's inevitable. But how we age is highly variable. Uh, some of us wind up, unfortunately, in nursing homes or other facilities because of needs that we have and assistance that we need. Others wind up uh, aging incredibly successfully. Here it says, this is from Time magazine, growing old gracefully. And I will, I will leave it up to you whether prancing around in front of your house in a bathing suit is graceful or not. That's not, 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 not my decision, but it certainly is, it certainly is very successful. And, and of course, the reality is, is in between. Uh, the reality is that the vast majority of older adults uh, live in a community, and, and, uh, and majority have some, kind of, some chronic illness and, and, and some, some health issues that they're dealing with. That's the most common scenario. So, what do we mean by precision gerontology? And that's really the focus or theme of our Pepper Center. Uh, Pepper Center, as I, as I think you all know, are named after Claude Pepper, who was a, a proponent, a supporter of, of senior issues in, in, uh, from Florida, both in the Senate and Congress. And, and they're also called Older Americans Independent Centers. But each Pepper Center needs to have a, a, a theme or focus. And this kind of illustrates uh, graphically w w what our thoughts are about precision gerontology. This idea that if you begin on the, on, on the far left, um, there are important differences. Of course, no two babies are quite alike. Every baby is special. But we tend to be more or less similar to each other in terms of our health status, in terms of our physical ability, et cetera. But as we grow older, uh, in, all, in all ways, we get more and more different from each other. And what, what this figure illustrates is how we get different from each other in terms of physical performance, which has been a major focus of the, of the Pepper Center here. Uh, all the way from individuals who age as well as whose physical perform who run marathons, as we see at the top, um, to, to those who are, are bed-bound and everything in between. And, and we, we try to conceptualize this as is, is a, obviously this presents major challenges for, for, for health care providers, for, for individuals who are aging themselves, but it also provides incredible opportunities for more precise targeting and improving outcomes. And that's really been the focus of what we do. And of course, all of that is focused on improving function, independence, and quality of life, which is really the focus of, of, all, of all Pepper Centers. And so what we mean by precision gerontology, and this is, I'm going to come back to this over and over again today, it's really a multidisciplinary approach. 
It cannot be done by any one discipline alone, but that actually applies to clinical care of older adults, and I think, and I think this is something that's been clear for many years. And a multidisciplinary approach that seeks to better understand heterogeneity of aging, this increasing variability between us as we age, in all of its dimensions, and I'll get back to that. It has to be all of its dimensions, cannot be just one aspect of us. And then uses such information to develop interventions that are more effective by being more precise and targeted. So uh, I also want to re revolve kind of where we are with the evolving science of geriatric care. And I think it's important to realize that, that while humans have lived to old age since time eternal, uh, the field of geriatric medicine in this country is, is quite young. Uh, actually, Elena and I are part, are part of the first generation that were trained as geriatricians. Uh, many of us who preceded us, like, like, uh, like, like Dr. Goodwin, uh, actually trained in other disciplines and then moved into geriatrics. So geriatrics is still a very young field. And, and how it's evolved, the pillars, if you will, of state-of-the-art geriatric care, it began with a realization that older adults are fundamentally different and their care must be different. Older adults are not just older versions of young people, just like a child is not a small version of, of, a, of, a, of an adult. And it was followed by a recognition of common multifactorial geriatric syndromes, conditions such as, such as dementia, frailty, and, and other conditions, falls that you, I'm sure you've heard about here many times before. And it also came to the realization that, there's, that in order to address these conditions, because they're multifactorial, because there are many different risk factors that contribute to these conditions, there's no easy solution. There's no magical solution. Maybe other than exercise, right? right? <laughs> other than exercise, there's no magical solution that will fix everything. And so there's a role for multi-component interventions. A lot of research had been done showing that combining different interventions in a way that targets these different deficits uh, can be very helpful. And, and so that also was followed by a realization of pleiotropic interventions. And what I mean by that is interventions that have effects throughout the body, that really have beneficial effects such as throughout the body, such as exercise, are, are highly beneficial. And in a way, I mean to be a little bit provocative here. I'm not saying that research into how exercise benefits us is not important. But from a clinical point of view, if it works, what clinicians will tell you, if it works, then who cares how it works, right? Uh, and of course, it's important to, to, to follow up that further. And, and this is also was followed up by an era in, in, in geriatrics, which I would put back to the, in the 80, 1980s or so. And I have to be careful what I say here because uh, if there's an endocrinologist in the audience and I say this was the endocrine era of, of geriatrics, um, sometimes they get a little upset. But, but the fact is that we went through an era where if the level of something declined, X I call it, declined with aging, as a lot of things do, a uh, level of a hormone, for example, then the solution had to be to replace it. And we've learned the hard way that it doesn't work that way, that growth hormone, shown in GH here, uh, may put muscle bulk, may make a person look better, but it doesn't really help their function. Uh, similarly, estrogen, until a few decades ago, were, um, physicians were prescribing estrogen replacement for every woman going through the menopause. We no longer do that because of a seminal clinical trial called, called the Women's Health Initiative that showed that in the vast majority of women it's not beneficial, but that there are subsets where it is very important. And there are studies ongoing with testosterone, we'll be in, in a study right now, and as well as vitamin D, to identify which subsets of older adults benefits from those replacements. But it's not across the board. It's not, not everybody by any means. So more recent developments that I'm going to be sharing with you today is the importance of team science. And importance of team everything has always been the, the mantra in, in, in geriatric care, because you cannot take comprehensive care of older adults alone. It has to be a team effort. But in terms of research, that's more of a recent realization. And I'm going to show you ways that it can be done that go all the way from bench to the bedside to the community and health policy. And I think there are some wonderful examples at this institution that I've heard about today. i also share with you role for geroscience guided therapies, and that's really, I'll talk more about this. It's an effort to target biological aging in a way that, that one can potentially delay not one but multiple chronic diseases of aging, for which aging is the greatest risk factor. And then finally, the heterogeneity of aging that I talked about earlier the targeting of subpopulations or individuals may matter. So I also want to say a few words about understanding the difference between actuarial risk as opposed to clinical risk. And 
Has any has anybody here worked for an insurance company? Um, so, uh, I, I, so having worked in the Greater Hartford area, Hartford, Connecticut, as you know, is the insurance capital of the country. A lot of lots of hands go up, and so people who work for insurance companies are very good at applying mathematical and statistical models to assess risk. Okay, that's the whole business model. If you couldn't do that, you could not run a successful business. But it's important to realize that insurance companies don't particularly care which individual gets what disease, okay? It's not because they, they're not, they're, they're, they don't, they're, they're bad people. It's because what affects their business model is the likelihood that something bad will happen, regardless of what that is. It's the financial risk that they care about. And, and so what I want to share with you today is that we're, not that we're excellent at predicting actuarial risk, okay? We're now very good. And there are, there are clocks that we can measure in people, okay? Biological clocks of aging. There are risk models. And I said, and I said earlier, insurance companies are really good at this. If they weren't, they would go out of business, okay? They can predict if they should sell you an insurance policy or not and how much they should charge you. However, we're not good. We remain very poor at predicting clinical risk. And what I mean by clinical risk is really the ability, what clinicians want to do is to understand clinical risk in terms of information that helps to define risk at the level of the individual patient sitting in front of them. Okay, that's what the physician cares about. That's what the patient cares about in a way that leads to point of care. And what, what, what I mean by point of care is in the office, okay? Not a week later, not a month later, but in the office, joint decision-making and actions that could improve outcomes, okay? That's what we all want, and that's incredibly difficult to do. And I'll try to address of that. So in terms of heterogeneity of aging, one of the things those of us being in the field for a while have heard many times, and I could mention a few names that you've heard, some that you have not, who've said something along the lines. When you've seen one older person, all you have seen is one older person, which really, to me, this was actually told to me by my first job, by Jack Rowe, who was my first, gave me my first job. And it really hit home the message is that you cannot generalize about aging, okay? Because every... Every individual who ages is, is, is an N of one. It's an experiment on one's own because everybody ages a little bit differently. The other thing that you've heard many people say, including myself, is as we age, we all get more different from each other. And yet, in spite of that, in spite of this being kind of a foundational belief of geriatric medicine and gerontology, there is very little evidence to support. I mean, there is evidence, but it's scattered throughout the literature. So I'm going to share some evidence with you. And this is actually some data that I published with Luigi Ferrucci that was uh, this, this experiment took five minutes from conception to, to publication, okay? So this was Luigi pressing. So Dr. Ferrucci is a scientific director of the NIA. He runs the intramural program at National Institute on Aging and the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. And I asked him, I said, do you have any data that would show that we showed this, this issue of increasing heterogeneity of aging. And he pressed like three buttons, and then two minutes later we had this graph. And what it shows on the left, it shows in red age on the x-axis. And this is fasting glucose. So simply something as basic as measuring the fasting glucose after an overnight fast in healthy volunteers. These are pretty healthy people, okay? Retired civil workers in, 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 the, in, in the Baltimore region shows increasing spread with age, okay? increasing heterogeneity with, with age, static value. On the right side in blue, you have something called the oral glucose tolerance test. And some of you may have had this, where basically you go to a physician, you have a glucose meal, an hour later they measure the ability of your system to, to, to metabolize glucose. It's a, it's a dynamic test. Again, spread increases with aging. So there is evidence. And, and as you look through the literature, I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but regardless of what you look at, if you look at very basic biology of aging, if you look at something like damage on, in our DNA, for example, with aging, is one example. If you look at physiological function, as you show here, if you look at physical performance, speed walking, if you look at clinical outcomes, everything becomes more variable with aging. So what do I mean by precision gerontology? And I'm going to take you through three levels that our Pepper Center has now started to think about this. And we're really in the early stages of this because it's remarkable how, how little work has been done in this area. So first of all, when, when someone comes to us and they want to do, submit a pilot project application or Pepper Scholar application, one way of looking at it is, does the study allow us to gain a deeper understanding of the heterogeneity of aging? 
And, and the way we look at that is, is three levels. One is looking at observational data. This is data that you capture in one point in time, like the fasting glucose. Does it allow us to understand better the heterogeneity of risk factors or something bad happening down the road? A second level is, does it allow us to understand heterogeneity of mechanisms for studies that are more mechanistic? So the first one captures more observational studies, population studies, epidemiology, if you will. The second one captures more heterogeneity of mechanisms, which are more biological or mechanistic studies. And finally, is heterogeneity of treatment effects. And those of you who do clinical trials, this is a very common concept where if you do a large clinical trial, no matter how well done, you very often see individuals within, say, everybody benefits to some extent from the intervention. But there are some people who benefit a lot more, some people who benefit less, and some people don't benefit at all. And that's heterogeneity of treatment effects. Very difficult to study uh, because of power issues, but very, very important. At the second level, we tend to look at, does this study or approach help us develop a more effective intervention through improved targeting informed by heterogeneity. And there, again, building on the previous slide, we asked the question, will this study allow us, in the, if not now, then in the future, to better target shared risk factors, okay? So just to give you one example very quickly, um, there's very nice work, we've done some of it, showing that decreased mobility, which is studied here, is the risk factor for a lot of bad things happening, uh, for becoming disabled, uh, for developing delirium when an individual is hospitalized for developing incontinence, okay? So, so actually decreased walking is in many ways a bigger risk factor for incontinence and bladder dysfunction, okay? So it's a shared risk factor, and there's actually very nice research published that if you, if you treat an individual who had these problems with an exercise intervention, their, not only their mobility gets better, but their incontinence gets better, as an example, okay? Then shared mechanisms, another way of targeting, and geroscience is a way of targeting shared mechanisms I'll get to in a minute. And far, finally, targeting subpopulations. So even if your, your study will not allow you to inform treatment at the level of individual, treatment decisions at the level of the individuals, it may still allow you to say, okay, people among all patients coming to my office People who are in this cluster will benefit from this intervention, whereas people over here are more likely to benefit from another intervention. And then finally, uh, because our, and I'll get to this in a minute, because everything in our center has focused around uh, four functional domains, and we do a lot of work focused on mobility, behavior and cognition, host defense, and also avoiding incontinence, we like our projects to be somewhat relevant to, to at least one of these, and often they're relevant to multiple. So, it, obviously, doing this is not simple, and so our approach re really requires to do something like this is ambitious. It, it requires the ability to address heterogeneity in a manner that's integrative, multidisciplinary, and translational, something that I saw in abundance here today during my visit, and I think something you should be very proud of. And so these are the four domains that our center focuses on, four important determinants of independence later in life that I mentioned earlier. And so just to give you a little background uh, in terms of what, what, has allowed, what are some of the ingredients that have allowed us to, to be successful in this, one is that we're a multidisciplinary center that was created specifically to provide integration between different professions and spheres of disciplinary activity. And we have, we're not a large center. We, we only have 26 core faculty based in the center whose academic appointments are in eight different clinical or basic departments to cover the range of disciplinary backgrounds that, that we cover. Uh, but we have nearly 100 affiliates across the university and, J and Jackson Lab on our campus. And so, again, I think what's, what's somewhat unique about our, our Pepper Center, as well as I think the one here, is that we have strong programs that go from bench to bedside translation, but at the same time, we also have strong programs that cover translation from the institution to the community, to outcomes, to health policy across that whole continuum. And that, that I think is very important, uh, if, if when possible. And then our funding actually comes from not just the National Institute of Health, but also from private agencies, as, as well as PCORI, CMS, CMS, and other agencies to cover the spectrum of research that we do. So just to give you an introduction, this is our main campus. Uh, this, is wh this is where the, the, uh, the medical school is located in Farmington, Connecticut, exactly halfway between New York and Boston along Route 84, almost exactly halfway. Uh, dental school is there, graduate school, uh, and our clinical operation. We also work closely with the Storrs campus, 
uh, which is 37 miles away along Route 84 again. And that's where our other uh, disciplines and schools are located, as well as Hartford and our important partner is Jackson Lab, uh, who's, who built, uh, almost 10 years ago, built an institute for genomic medicine, uh, all human genomic medicine on our campus, shown, uh, highlighted on the right, and who have another, uh, another campus in Bar Harbor that focuses mostly on, on mouse research, but actually has, has major, as an NIH shock center and as a major site in the NIA interventions uh, treatment program, which is a major pr program for discovering new interventions into, into enhancing longevity and health span uh, with aging. So I want to begin, I said I would talk about an illustrative case. Um, uh, no names mentioned here because it's an amalgam of many patients I've seen over the year, but this is a couple in their 70s who come to see their provider uh, seeking advice on which specific flu and pneumococcal vaccine formulation to take because they have heard you know, they're bombarded with ads about this vaccine and that vaccine. Uh, they, they're convinced that vaccines are helpful, but which ones should they take? So, and if you go to, this was just updated last week, but if you go to the recommendations from, from the CDC, um, they don't say a whole lot. I mean, they basically say that you can take the inactivated, uh, an inactivated quadrivalent vaccine or the recombinant vaccine, and it's recommended across the ages. And if you drill down a little bit, uh, this is what we've learned, if to put it in context. And we've done a lot of research over the years that have shown that there are declines with aging immune protection that are, that, are, um, uh, that, 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 that are addressed by influenza vaccines, that are overcome with treatments in influenza vaccines. The high dose, this is mostly the, the flu zone high dose vaccine, uh, quadrivalent is FDA approved now. That's one option, as, as is the regular dose vaccine. And we've shown now, we've published a number of many studies over the years that the high-dose vaccine is actually much more effective than the low-dose in particularly enhancing the, the humoral even more so than the deficits in the cell-mediated immune response and able to overcome some aspects of immune response declines attributable to aging and frailty. And then that has raised the question of who should receive the high-dose versus standard-dose vaccine. And and it, it, it's not a trivial decision because the high-dose vaccine is actually associated with more, more side effects. Those of you who have had it have noted that uh, it works better, it overcomes deficits better, but there are a lot more, much more in the way of systemic, systemic uh, reactions. And there is now a role, there's a new uh, uh, ajuvenated um, uh, vaccine called Fluad, which is now FDA approved, which is also getting a lot of attention and has some, some advantages as well. And there are some, there's a lot of work ongoing with mRNA-based vaccines for influenza. Similar technology, what's being used for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is now being applied to influenza. And we expect that, uh, that, that some may be, ex uh, 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 may be approved in the near future. And I'll give you some examples where we're using geroscience-guided approaches to overcoming declines in immune responses with aging. In particular, uh, one of our faculty is doing a trial with a drug called metformin that is being shown to, I'll mention that later, to overcome, it's been used for diabetes for over half a century, but has this effect on multiple home, biological hallmarks of aging, and she's looking at the ability of this drug to improve vaccine, uh, her name is Jenna Bartley, improving vaccine responses to, to influenza vaccine with aging. So in terms of studying this, and this goes back to work that Jan McElhaney and I had done for, together for many years, showing that if you, and we've had a grant for many years that compares high dose to standard dose influenza vaccine. So if you look at a pop, population of older adults here, and what we've typically done is recruit from the community, have participants come in, and we draw blood at, 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 when they come in, then we give them the vaccine, we'd randomize them to low dose or high dose, and then we would draw um, blood samples at different time points to, re to reflect on the early, early um, immune responses as well as intermediate and late, with the flu season typically coming around um, 10 weeks, the third visit. And, th and the challenge has been that although, the, although flu is, can be a devastating infection in older adults, it's one of only many different infections that occur, upper respiratory tract infections. So, there's a lot more respiratory tract infections that are not influenza than influenza. And so what we focused on is identifying influenza infection that can be proven by PCR lab-based techniques together with systemic illness, risk of hospitalization, in many cases loss of function, unfortunately often 
loss of death, to really what he tried to do is identify that single individual who just flew in there at the bottom, who amongst all of these individuals is more vulnerable to developing really bad outcomes after getting flu. Okay, that's the challenge. And of course, you're trying to do this retroactively. I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a retroscope that allows us to look back. But what we do have is an approach, which I'll illustrate here, where upper respiratory tract infections are common, as I mentioned. But the attack rates for flu, for influenza, are actually very low. As serious a problem as it is, any given season, depending on which strain is prevalent, only 1 to 5% of individuals exposed to influenza virus actually get the infection. So we need to identify those people who, who have developed symptomatic influenza infection, not some other upper respiratory tract infection. And again, it's got this, in spite of that, it's got this really remarkable effect on hospitalization, morbidity, and mortality, um, especially in very older adults. And even before COVID, up to 70,000 excess deaths in this country occurred every year because of influenza, in spite of the wonderful vaccines that we have. So they need to be improved. Um, and so what we typically do is use what's called a test negative study design, where we compare individuals who we collect, we recruit all these individuals, we collect blood on them, and then we screen them, we stay in touch with them over the phone, we identify individuals develop symptoms, and then those develop symptoms, we do a swab. And so we compare individuals who we know had influenza infection, and we compare them to somebody who did not, matching them on age, sex, frailty, and CMV status, CMV cytomegalovirus. It's a virus that actually is very common in most people during aging, and, and, and one we need to know more about. I'm sure there'll be questions about it. Um, and this is the kind of data that we're generating. I wanna, I'm not gonna have time to present it, so we do a lot of single cell um, RNA seq work. This is with human blood. This is from an individual drawn before the vaccine was given, okay? And human blood, which is easy to obtain, allows us to study immune system. And it, these immune system is, again, incredibly heterogeneous, made up of, of all kinds of immune cells. But what these approaches allow us to do is actually drill down to the level of individual cells and this is just some baseline data showing that you've got a cluster of, of cells with a big blue one at the top, which are mostly T cells. Then you've got some B cells, which are to the far left. And then you have some monocytes and re related cells at the bottom. So again, I'm not going to be able to drive in not enough time to get into the details of this. But the point is we're trying to identify an immunogenomic signature which is unique for that individual, which is unique for those people who, when their blood is drawn at baseline, they go on to develop influenza infection later on versus those who do not, okay? To try to develop an approach that in the future would allow us to really, uh, to target those individuals with more potent vaccines and more potent approaches. And this is the kind of data that you get. I'm just gonna walk you, this is just oversight here again, overview a little bit. You can see, um, so this is basically on the, on the left, you have individuals in purple here, it's kind of purple, who, who developed flu. And on the right, you have in green individuals who did not, did not develop flu. And you can see these are genes. It's a heat map of genes with heavier expression is brown so, and, and lighter expression is, is, is white. And you can see that there are, there are clusters of genes in brown which are expressed at much higher level. This, each line is an individual gene at a much higher level than people who develop flu versus people who did not develop flu, okay? Now, it gets more complicated because actually CMV status plays a very important role in that, but I'm not gonna have time to get into that. Unfortunately, uh, I can refer you to papers we published in this, but I'm not gonna be able to get into this in detail today. I'm happy to answer questions. And actually, that brings me to a study that's ongoing right now. This was a grant that's now just finishing its first year. It's a collaboration between, the, it's an NIAID grant with, between Dewey Guichar, who's a wonderful computational geneticist at Jackson Lab, myself and Adolfo Garcia Sestra, who's a virologist at Mount Sinai. And what we've done now, we, we've recruited a cohort of, of healthy older adults who will sequentially receive three different influenza vaccines each year for three years. We just finished giving them a flu zone high dose vaccine. Um, well, I, I said this year, it's actually, it's this season, it's the last, last, last calendar year, but this season. Next year, or this year, this calendar season, uh, we're gonna give them Fluad, which is the adjuvenated vaccine. 
And then in year three, we anticipate giving them one of the mRNA influenza vaccines, which we expect will be FDA approved by then. And this way, we'll be able to develop a really deep understanding is what is it about individuals who, who really need the vaccine more? What is it about individuals who benefit from the vaccine more? And which of these vaccines are best for which individuals? So I think this is going to be a really result in a lot of in, in, in important information. So the other vaccine we talked about, the pneumococcal vaccine, and that's an interesting story because um, I'm sure everybody and most people in this room have had discussions regarding pneumococcal vaccine. And, and that's kind of an interesting story just to explain to you what this means. So this, these are, again, CDC recommendations. We have two, there are two major flavors of pneumococcal vaccine. The old one is called Pneumovax. Many of you heard of it, uh, which is a polysaccharide vaccine. And there's a new one. Well, it's not so new. It's been used in children for a number of years, but it's new to use in older adults called Prevnar. And this Prevnar, uh, 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 there's Prevnar 15. There's now Prevnar 20 that's now recommended for older adults. And so the short story is that before the age of 65, pneumococcal vaccines are not recommended unless you have a serious chronic disease. After 65, it's recommended for everybody. And the current recommendations now are to give one dose of Prevnar 15, which is the conjugated vaccine, which works mostly by activating T cells, followed by Pneumovax, which, is, which, is, uh, uh, which, which works through a different mechanism, or one dose of Prevnar 20, which is a, this new, new formulation out there. The bottom line is that there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but, um, and to just summarize what I just told you here, um, but we, we're, we're just writing up a, a study now that I want to share with you, which is in collaboration with Jacques Bonchereau, a senior immunologist at Jackson Lab, and Louis Gouchard, where we basically recruited 19, um, we recruited 39 individuals, we had 40, but one dropped out, and we randomized them to receive healthy older adults who have never received either pneumococcal vaccine, which Connecticut, which is actually has a fairly high level of, 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 of health care, means people who've just turned 65 because, and who are healthy, okay? So these are people in their, early, in their late 60s, early 70s, and they were randomized uh, to receive either um, pneumovax, um, pneumovax or, or, or Prevnar in year one, and then in year two, they received the other vaccine. And then they underwent a lot of blood draws as well as uh, for serology, as well as um, to, to, to determine uh, opsonization titers to see which pneumococcal, which strain of pneumococcus they, they, they had, and also responses to, um, to those vaccines in terms of antibody titers. And, and basically, I'm sharing a lot of data here, but I wanna just highlight on one thing here, well, two things. One is that they had a signature, an immune signature of plasma blast activation. These are the cells that make antibodies that was completely different from that of influenza vaccine, okay? Which makes sense because one vaccine is against a virus, influenza, the other one is against a bacterium. So the signature was completely different. I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about that. What was interesting is that there was a ratio of immune cells, for TH1 to TH17 ratio, and again, the details don't matter, but that ratio predicted responses as to Prevnar, which is the one that works through T cell pathways, much better than Pneumovax. And what became even interesting is that women in this study, a small study, had a much higher levels of this ratio, and women had much stronger responses to Prevnar compared to men. So again, this needs to be replicated in a larger study. It was a, it was a small study, but it was very detailed, sophisticated, and, 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 uh, and sequential analysis. Uh, but this suggests that, that men and women are biologically different. And as we age, uh, it would suggest that women actually respond better to Prevnar than men. And then that this is something that we may need to consider in the future. So again, to move on to my case, so, so they made their decision about their vaccines, okay? And I'm sure there'll be some questions about that afterwards. Um, so in the meantime, they've heard of this new word called geroscience, and they don't know what the hell this means. And, by the way, most people who have never heard of geroscience have no idea what it means. We need a new word, but it's what we have for now. And so they've heard of geroscience, and they've heard, they, they saw something in the internet, some supplement, some dietary supplement that claims to target aging, okay? So they come to their PCP, and they want to know, what should I do, okay? So, so I just want walk, to walk you very briefly from making the case for geroscience. So what is this word geroscience? So this is a figure that, 
some of you may have seen, that basically illustrates something that has been a known fact for many decades, but has been blissfully ignored by all of us, okay? Uh, we were each so interested in studying our own disease um, that we forgot at looking at the whole big picture. So so interested were we in studying the role of cholesterol and heart disease that we ignored the fact that the biggest risk factor for, by far for getting heart disease in most people is aging. We were so interested in studying the role of APOE4 and, and amyloid in Alzheimer's disease, we forgot that the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease by far is aging. Same thing for cancer, et cetera. All of these ex increase significantly with age, and that is the, by far the greatest risk factor. And what this picture illustrates is that we've also learned a lot about biology of aging. And I'm not going to have time to go into detail all of this, but what that circle illustrates is that there are what are called hallmarks of aging or pillars of aging that illustrate the different ways, the different biological mechanisms that contribute to aging, that drive aging, if you will, okay? And each one of those could be a talk in itself, okay? And which one is more important than the others kind of depends on what, what your research interests are, okay? Because, of course, what you work is the most interesting. What's important, though, is they're all important. And that's become clear. What's also become clear is that they all interact with each other, okay? And so these pillars, these hallmarks of biological aging, which is everything from inflammation that you've heard of, changes involving the telomeres, cellular senescence we'll talk about briefly, the ability of a cell to, die, to take the garbage out, so to speak, to digest proteins that have, that have no, no longer functioning. All of, these, um, all of these contribute to aging. And so the geroscience hypothesis is basically proposed that if you look here, this is data out of Minnesota showing that the incidence of having at least three chronic diseases goes up exponentially with age. And this is something we've known for about a long time. It's, it's almost unheard of to, to live to old age and have no chronic diseases, but the risk of having multiple chronic diseases goes up with aging. And the idea of geros, the geroscience hypothesis is that if you target these biological hallmarks of aging through drugs that can influence them, you're able to push back this onset a little bit. And that could have a tremendous impact. Even a small push to the right could have a tremendous impact on the slowing the onset and progression of not just one chronic disease, but multiple chronic diseases. And, and there are now many examples from mouse research in particular that have shown that. And this is an example I was alluding to. It also works in terms of improving resilience, okay? The resilience, the ability to bounce back from a stressor. So I mentioned some of the work that's ongoing in our center to look at the ability of a drug called metformin to, to um, improve responses to, to vaccination and the ability to respond better to the stress of an infection when it does occur. And the whole idea is to improve trajectories of aging as shown on the right here uh, to improve, to prevent future declines in function and, and disability. So making the case for both precision gerontology and geroscience, and it needs to be both, it's, it really, it's a yin, yin and yang, if you will, where I feel very strongly that we cannot talk about gerontology and ignore everything that geroscience offers in terms of, in terms of potential of ex expanding the, the human health span. At the same time, uh, trying to address geroscience, just focusing on the biology of aging without addressing everything else that's important in terms of health status, in terms of what matters to individuals, would also be foolish. So both are important. And, and this is an illustration that we put together recently to, that really brings together three different components, which, which I feel very strongly interconnected. So one is health promotion, okay? And uh, cardiologists have come up with something called the Life's Essential Eight, which has to do with physical activity, eating better, stopping smoking, get good night's sleep, managing one's weight, uh, control cholesterol, of course, managing blood pressure, uh, blood managing one's sugar uh, if you're diabetic. All those are important. But these are not exclusive from talking about geroscience, targeting biological aging. And you really cannot be doing one with the other, without the other. And they work together. And finally, they tie in with something which, which we call the geriatric 5Ms, which is what's important to individuals as they age, and which is mo remaining mobile, uh, having a healthy mind, 
having, avoiding multiple morbidity, being cutting down to the number of medications that you take, and also addressing issues that, are, that matter the most to individuals. And I don't know if you can all read that. It's, it is kind of small for this, this size of the room, but I, I read, read all of it. And, and so the other thing that's very important in this approach is to develop a strategy that really uh, enhances di diverse geroscience-guided approaches um, to accomplish what I just showed you earlier, that push back. And the way to think about this is that you have multiple predisposing risk factors for almost any geriatric condition that you can think of, and you also have precipitating risk factors, and so which ultimately helps address declines in function and the emergence of clinical diseases and geriatric syndromes. So the, the, by targeting biological aging, we're really just adding this additional dimension here, targeting these shared risk factors for multiple chronic diseases. And this is something that we're part of an NIA-funded translational geroscience network. Because it's such a new field, we're trying to bring together centers around the country where none of them can do it alone, and to do it in a way that, that we can do it collectively and learn from each other and develop infrastructure. And we, have, uh, we now have dozens of clinical trials that are currently underway at our centers across the country. And it's also important to realize that there, there's a role for precision in geroscience, <clears throat> that there are many different paths towards individual hallmarks of aging. And this is just example from the work uh, done in our center and elsewhere on cellular senescence. So senescent cells are cells that are no longer able to divide, but they're no longer able to divide, but they continue to produce uh, molecules as illustrated here, um, actually easier for me to show here, these molecules showing here that have, that cause damage in the surrounding tissues and sometimes even distant tissues. And now, now there are drugs called senolytics that actually allow senescent cells to die, that, that block that inhibition, and senomorphics that, that inhibit the effects of these circulating molecules and the damage that they cause. And this is just examples of some papers um, that uh, one of our faculty, Ning Zhu, has published recently, highlighting the fact that there are actually, and I'm not going to be able to get into details of this, that there are multiple ways to get to senescence, okay? And you can, you can cells can become senescence because of t damage to DNA, telomere attrition, because of mutations, because of radiation, multiple ways that cells can become senescence. And the two major pathways are P16, which has been traditionally studied, and and P21, where, where our colleague was the first one to highlight the role of P21 in senescence and as a target for drugs, again, highlighting the heterogeneity of the biological uh, pathways to, to aging. And there are also important differences in cellular senescence between and within tissues, species, and disease states. And this is a, a map just from a recent paper talking about the SENET network, which shows the, the institutions in the country that are involved in this initiative to map senescent cells in humans. And, and this is very important because we know a lot about cellular senescence in tissue culture, and we know quite a bit about cellular senescence in animal models, but we know very little about senescence in humans. And that's going to be very important in developing uh, new treatments. And these are some of the organs that we're going to be mapping as part of this initiative using a variety of techniques for profiling senescent cell heterogeneity uh, within the tissues, both at the level of, in terms of gene expression individual cells, as well as mapping of these senescent cells within the tissues, be the tissue, whatever the tissue may be, be it lung or whatever. And, and our, our center, the, the one I lead, is actually focused on mapping cellular senescence in the kidney placenta. And I'm sure somebody's going to ask, what does placenta have to do with aging? Well, it actually turns out that cellular senescence, while it clearly is bad, in most situations with aging and something we want to eradicate, it's actually essential to aspects of placental formation. So it's essential to development. So we can't just willy-nilly try to eradicate senescence everywhere. And actually a colleague of ours at Mayo Clinic, Vesna Garvich, has, has shown that senescent cells are implicated in preeclampsia. Um, and, and so anyway, that there's a link there. And, uh, and so there's a heterogeneity in terms of at the level of interconnected hallmarks and multiple morbidity. And this is just an illustration of that, that if you study the, the onset of clinical diseases and geriatric syndromes on the far right, um, you have these shared risk factors that I talked about earlier that all contribute, that are shared. So these different 
the reason it's been so difficult to make an impact here is that these are exceedingly complicated conditions that have multiple risk factors. And we're very good at targeting diseases when there's one risk factor. We're not so good at targeting diseases where multiple risk factors, and they're shared. But it's an opportunity because it turns out that in this situation, interventions like that touch upon multiple risk factors like exercise are highly beneficial, but interventions as shown here, the target biological hallmarks of aging are also beneficial because they target these shared risk factors, okay? And, and that's, that's the goal here, is by targeting these downstream and upstream the hallmarks of biolog biological aging as shown here, you're able to have an impact on multiple uh, different conditions downstream because they're shared in many cases. So, to go on with our story a little bit, so our couple does just fine, but then a little pandemic. There's a, all of a sudden, Wuhan is on the news, and, uh, and next thing they know, they both developed COVID, and I'm sure that's happened to many of us in this room. Um, but while um, the missus has very mild symptoms, Mr. is hospitalized and actually is very sick. He winds up being intubated. Um, fortunately, he gets better, uh, but the question is, First of all, they're both the same age, and why did one, this really gets at the core of what I'm talking about. What is it about the fact you have these two, this couple, they live together, they eat the same food, same environment, same age. So this is one way of thinking about this, and this is actually, uh, this was published by an immunologist by the name of Jean-Marie Casanova, who's done some really exciting work about the genetics of, of infections. And he published this paper quite early in the pandemic where he was able to identify, he asked the question, all these people are exposed to SARS-CoV-2. What is about heterogeneity of outcomes about, among all these infected individuals? And you've got these people who have, you know, age is a risk factor here. Comorbidities are a risk factor. We know that. But why is it that you have some individuals as shown here, some young people who have no comorbidities who got really, really sick? And there are examples of young people people in their 20s who were intubated, some who died. And then you have people here who, in spite of their age and comorbidities, do really well. And you, you've all seen articles about, there was one from Italy, one from the UK, uh, a 95-year-old woman uh, lives through, you know, lives through, a 100-year-old woman lives through the 1918 pandemic, and then they just fine through this one, okay? And, uh, and what, what is it about them? And he actually identified, that's a whole separate story, he identified a mutation in interferon gamma, which is a very important immune response gene. And basically, these people who were so vulnerable had mutations of this gene, and that's why they were so, well, that's why they were so likely to become re really sick and even die uh, when exposed to the virus. But the question we're asking from a giraffe point of view is really very different. We're not interested in the very, very rare. I mean, it's, it can be interesting scientifically, but to make an impact, the question we're asking is, what about everybody else, okay? What is, it about, what is it about everybody else that makes some people more vulnerable, some people less, when everything else is, is relatively similar? And again, this gets at the issue of precision gerontology to better understand this multi-factor complexity, because we know it's not going to be one factor, it's going to be multiple factors, and this heterogeneity of aging to develop interventions that are more targeted and more effective. So age, or chronological age, which is very simple, very simple to define. I, I can actually predict your chronological age very well, 100% accuracy, as long as you give me your birth date, okay? And, and as, long as, you're, you're, as long as you give me your correct birth date, I can do it correctly. So we know that birth date or chronological age cannot be the whole story because the highest risk population for COVID-19 deaths included older adults with chronic diseases, particularly those listed here. Um, multimorbidity, just having lots of chronic diseases with an additional important risk factor. And this is something that I'm going to get to in some detail because we have some data to, that helps us understand why. Older men were at much greater risk for de developing severe complications of COVID, COVID than older women, and we, we know why now. Uh, we, obesity, uh, and that could actually be in part because of accumulation of senescent cells with obesity. Poverty, perhaps race, or additional risk factors. Um, uh, Chowling Kuo, who's a wonderful biostatistician and statistical genetics, geneticist on our faculty, was the first one to identify APOE4 genotype as a major risk factor of dying from COVID and being hospitalized from COVID. 
uh, beyond its effect on, on dementia. Um, and, and so chronological age is you know, the number of times that the planet Earth has turned during your life is not the best predictor. And so other factors such as frailty, chronic diseases, physiology, social factors, and biology all add additional clinical information, getting back to the schema that I showed you at the beginning. And I want to just briefly summarize. This is a published paper that came out actually now in 2020. This was work done before COVID, but I think speaks directly to, to this to this sex difference in terms of vulnerability um, to COVID. So this was a cohort recruited with, with um, Dr. Jacques Bonchereau and Viggo Utkukar. Uh, recruited healthy subjects. These are people, 81 men, 91 women of different ages, people who basically were healthy. They might have taken medications for blood pressure, high cholesterol, but generally healthy. We did serial blood draws, and then we did very deep analysis of their immune status, uh, both in terms of genomic profiling where we studied gene expression using RNA-seq, what each cell produced in terms of what likely protein it would be making, as well as a TAC-seq, which is a way of looking at the chromatin and understanding which regions of chromatin are open and which are closed. The way you do that is ch you chop it up with an enzyme called, called transposone, and then you analyze it, and it, the enzyme only cleaves those portions of chromatin that are naked, if you will, that are open, okay, which are either making, which are either active or poised to be active. So this allowed us to get a deep understanding of peripheral blood cells from humans in terms of gene expression and chromatin profiling. And we also did flow cytometry to understand different composition of the elements in there. And then this was analyzed using a very sophisticated um, analytic pipeline that I'm not going to be able to get into detail to identify both shared and sex-specific aging signatures. So looking both at what's due to aging and how does sex modify that. And I'm going to summarize a great deal of information here. This, was, this is all published. And what it shows here on the left is a taxi, which is basically information on which portions of the chromosome are naked or open and which are closed. So open is active, closed is inactive. And RNA-seq, which tells you what, what is actually being transcribed, okay, and in terms of gene expression. And what's important here is that the pink, and these are, these are very sexist choice of colors, I guess, uh, but pink, pink is, is basically the changes with, which are more common with women after 65, and blue, which are more common with men after 65. And the bottom line here, without going into a lot of detail, is that that portion of the immune system, which is always ready to act, okay, and which also contributes to inflammation, which is not a good thing in many ways, is much more active in men. So, so men seem to age more quickly from the immune side of point of view than women, but women maintain more stronger adaptive immunity. That's the ability to respond to a new immune ch new challenge, okay? So that's very important because it tells us with SARS-CoV-2, the main problem with SARS-CoV-2 is most of us had, no pro had never seen that virus before because it didn't exist before. Some of us had immunity to other coronaviruses, which are kind of related, but most of us had no immunity to it. So that's one problem. This is why men were more vulnerable because their, immune imm their adaptive immunity was weaker. But you've also heard about, immunes, about I immune storm, which is this in the cytokine storm that occurs in, occurred with many many patients that contributed to mortality. And that's directly linked to activation of the innate immune side of things, okay? So we have a couple of explanations here for why, uh, why this gentleman was, had such a, that contributed to this gentleman's worst course uh, in, in the face of this infection compared to his, his, his spouse. Now, of course, things are not so, the geriatricians in the room know that, that um, things tend to get complicated in these situations. So, so he, he gets better somewhat, but then he gets a, doubt, a bout of C. difficile diarrhea, um, and then he's found to be colonized with MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And, and that kind of brings us to the next level of the story, because these are major problems that complicate the recovery. Of course, um, the diarrhea can make it very difficult for the person to gain nutrition, to gain strength. It, may, it weakens people. And developing these, these drug re antibiotic resistance organisms actually makes people much more vulnerable. Plus, institutions don't want to take them because they don't want to have that in their house. So this complicates. And it brings us to the next story. 
which is where we looked at um, frailty-associated dysbiosis of the skin. So this is a study we published recently uh, in collaboration with Julia O, oh, also at Jackson Lab you know, on our campus. This is actually the first author um, is, a, is an MD-PhD student. Yeah, she presented this at the Pepper Center meeting uh, a few months ago. And this was basically a very systematic study of the microbiome uh, done in, in nursing home residents. And let me explain to you what we did here. So, so microbiome is actually, um, our bodies are actually incredibly dirty, all parts of it. And then so we have, we have billions and billions of organisms in our gut, also in our mouth, also in our skin. And that's perfectly normal because most of these are healthy bacteria, healthy organisms that allow us to, to maintain good health. But there's been a lot of literature associating changes in the gut, including those that lead to disinfection called C. difficile, that makes, make people much more vulnerable. Uh, the problem has been that these studies were done, there are small, small size of studies typically, and they were typically done only in the community or in nursing homes, and they were typically done using an approach using only looking in one part of the body, only looking in the gut, and using a technology which is called 16 RNA sequences, sequencing, which doesn't allow you to look at all the organisms in the entire genome. So what we did here is we recruited, uh, in collaboration with Julie Robison, who's who I realized a uh, um, number, number of faculty know here, um, we recruited subjects at three different skilled nursing facilities in Connecticut, as well as a cohort of, of community-dwelling age-matched older adults. And what is unique about our study is that we sampled not just the gut, but we sampled multiple, uh, the mouth as well as multiple skin sites. We measured frailty in great detail. We measured diet, oral hygiene, demographics, and medical history. And we also performed sequential studies, you know, over, repeated over time. And we did this using metagenomic sequencing, which allows us to, do, to, 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 to sequence all the organisms um, at all these sites, not just bacteria, but also fungi and virus, everything. And these are the sites that, that were sampled. You can see there was a very um, detailed sampling of different skin sites, in part because our skin is very different. Our skin in the palm of our hands tend to sweat much more than our skin, for example, on our, on our chest. So they were sampled at multiple sites. And just to share with you what we found is we found microbiome changes were associated with frailty much more so than age, um, which, which was, which, which was um, somewhat unexpected. We also found that there were prominent changes in microbiome features that were associated with susceptibility to pathogen colonization and disease risks such as changes in diversity, stability, heterogeneity, and biogeographic determinism, which basically means what part of the body the organism tends to be at, okay? Um, and we also found there's a bacterium called C. acnes, which actually is the cause of acne, which I'm sure is familiar to everybody here, um, which, but it's actually a very important health, it promotes healthy skin aging. And um, there was lots of that with aging. And we also found that the skin microbiota was primary reservoir for antimicrobial resistance, clinically important pathobionts and nosocomial strains, particularly in people in nursing homes and those who were, who were frail. And we found, therefore, the skin microbiome is a, is, a, is, a, is a potential risk factor for dissemination of these multidrug resistant pathogens and couldn't help inform therapeutic strategies and prophylactic strategies for leveraging microbiota to reduce infection risk. And this is just some of the data here, just very briefly to show you that basically this, these are different sites of the body. And you can see this is age and this is frailty. And basically, these are organisms that are found to be, to be, to, to predict this, to be predictive of age or frailty. And you can see that age was not associated with any of these parameters, but frailty was associated for many of these particular organisms. And many of them are, are organisms that are associated with unhealthy aging and disease. And what's shown here in terms of drug resistance is in, in, the, in the mouth, the gut, but especially in the skin, we found a very high prevalence of organisms that were associated with just about every drug resistance you can imagine from, uh, you know, for, I mean, the, the list is long, all the way to, from, all the way, from rifamycin, rifamycin all the way to fusidic acid and everything in between. 
So, so there obviously is a lot of opportunity to develop strategies that are more targeted, particularly in the nursing home setting. So one night, our gentleman get, gets up at night. He's a little confused, which is very common in the setting. He gets up, goes to the bathroom, he falls and breaks a hip. So not a lucky guy. But as a colleague of mine used to say, it's kind of a downward spiral. When, when one thing goes bad in, in patients like this, it's often many. And then the more things that go bad, that engenders other things. So things are not going so well with gentlemen. And so I want to introduce the fact that that this cannot be just about the biology of aging, as important that it is, that, that the role of behavior is very important. And this is work that was done uh, on the role of behavioral heterogeneity, showing that psychological resilience and walking capacity in older adults following hip fracture is very important. This was actually work published by Rick Fortinsky, who is a multiple PI of our Pepper Center, who's a social and behavioral scientist. And this was done through the CAP study. Were you involved in the CAP study uh, uh, with Jay Magnus? And this was a study of hip fracture an intervention looking at exercise as a way of enhancing recovery after hip fracture, which most older adults who break a hip don't recover function after, after hip fracture. And what it basically showed that it behavior res, behavioral resilience, which basically this is the belief. If you ask somebody, do you think you're going to get better, okay? And the belief that you will get better so that people who, scare, who scored very low on the behavioral risk score, wind up doing worse in all of these parameters. So another way of putting this, on measure of gates, four meter gate speed, uh, 50 foot walk test, six minute walk, walk distance, all of these parameters improved much more in people who had a higher resilience and people who had a behavioral resilience beforehand. And this, of course, opens the, the opportunity for multiple behavioral interventions to enhance resilience. So I'm going to just end up with uh, a couple of final thoughts in terms of what happens in long-term care. So his function improves, but cognitive deficits remained. Uh, he required assistance with transfers and, and his transfer to long-term care. And his wife wishes to take him home, but is concerned with her ability to take, provide coordinated clinical care and meeting his needs. So to come back to our scenario transitioning between uh, long-term care in the community. Um, we're a site for the Money Follows the Person program, the MFP program, which is really an effort across the country to rebalance uh, long-term care and to get folks back uh, back into the community who, who wish to do so, uh, offering a choice of where to live and overcoming barriers that, that lead to this. And eligibility is if you want to move out of an institution, if you've been there more 90 days or more, if you're on Medicaid, because most people in long-term care wind up on, on Medicaid, and involves help with transitional planning, as shown here. And in Connecticut, Julie Robinson, our faculty in our center, who actually leads our recruitment and community engagement core, it does the evaluation for the program across the state and, and has had lots of positive outcomes. And the reason I'm bringing this up, there's room areas for improvement, and the fact is uh, there are multiple categories of disability that contribute to people winding up in a nursing home. Uh, it's not just young people, but not just older people, but also young people with physical disability. And while there be many benefits, using a precision gerontology approach, there's lots of opportunity for even better improving outcomes and identifying the people most likely to benefit from this. And this last example I want to illustrate is a, is a PCORI-funded trial that's now in its final year, uh, led by Rick Fortinsky that's looking, it's a clinical trial, looking at older adults living in, throughout the state of Connecticut who are on a, on a managed Medicare uh, plan and who, who have dementia, depression, and or delirium. And it's looking at benefits of a nurse-coordinated care model and identifying if that helps uh, maintain uh, people in the community compared to usual care with great heterogeneity in terms of cognitive vulnerability as shown here, other morbidities, and multidisciplinary team involving many members, all of whom are engaged as needed. And, um, and so I want to just end up by saying that to improve meaningful outcomes for most older individuals, geriatric care needs to be guided by a deep and multidimensional understanding of the heterogeneity between older adults. Dimensions that must be incorporated range from underlying biological drivers of aging to variations in clinical presentations, as well as differences in lifespan experiences, racial and socioeconomic background, and personal preferences. 
we can't just pick those that, that we're more interested in. They have to encompass all of these, which, which is why this multidisciplinary approach is so important. And therefore, the argument is not either or, precision gerontology and precision geroscience, it's both. And, and finally, I just want to say that we are living in the golden age of team science. And, and, um, and I think it's just a really exciting time to be, to be doing this. And, and I want to thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. We went a little bit long the past the hour, so I would like to take one question and then we can have other questions with the glass of wine in hand. Any questions? There. You, you can use the microphone right on your table. Yeah, you just need to keep it pushed. Keep it pushed. No, really you. wonderful talk, and I, I was just intrigued by your clinical studies uh, by comparing the flu zone and the flu ad. So, you know, the difference is, is the adjuvant. One has the adjuvant, one doesn't. Right. So uh, I'm just curious, is there anything new about the difference? Well, individual? the adjuvant that works really well is, I don't know if any of you had the, had the Shingrix vaccine. Uh, that's one, I don't know how you felt after it. I had mine. Uh, that's, 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 that works very well. It works clinically very well, but it also has lots of side effects, and that's because of the adjuvant in it. And, and so there's a lot of work on adjuvants, which is a basically a way of adding something to the vaccine that stimulates the system even more, the idea being that if the system is even revved up even more, it's going to respond better. So the answer in terms of flu ad, we don't have the results yet because we just finished vaccinating people with flu zone uh, now, and then in the next season we're going to be vaccinating them with flu ad. But that's exactly the kind of question we want to ask, but does it, they have not been compared side by side in terms of, you know, what, what, what are the immune responses uh, that differ between the vaccines and also between individuals? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, we're going to have a wine and cheese session, so uh, you can stick with, the, with the, our speaker, Dr. Kushel. Thank you very much, George. And uh, we'll have, um, you can come back or we can go outside and eat there.